Do you know, 2015 was a uh, interesting year for my personal family, for Michael and I and our two boys, because uh, Angus started kindy, and uh, he's in year four now, so that was a fair while ago, but he started kindy, and the very day that he went to kindy, we went out to ice for ice cream, me and the boys, to celebrate, and I uh, had an accident and broke my ankle. <laughs> wasn't funny um, at the time. But um, broke my ankle, had to go to hospital. They told me you can't go home. Uh, you actually have to have an operation. I ended up having to have seven pins. I've still got them in my ankle. And uh, then I couldn't walk on it for eight weeks. Couldn't drive, couldn't pick up the kids from school. Um, so all of a sudden our family went into uh, learning how to help mum a lot more around the home. We had to get a, we had to hire a wheelchair so I could like wheel around because I couldn't walk on crutches and try and cut up dinner and stuff like that. And so I'd have Angus on my lap and off we'd go and it was very interesting. <laughs> um, and then uh, two weeks after I was back, well, a week actually, I think, after I was back driving, all that sort of stuff, my husband was retrenched in his job in the printing industry. And so we're like, what is going on? What is happening this year? And so... Uh, you know, six months before that, he'd said to me, what do you think about me becoming a primary school teacher? And I said, I think you'd be fantastic because he's great with kids. And uh, he'd worked in the printing industry for 16 years and but did nothing about it. Sort of thought, well, that's a big change for our family to have to quit my job and go and study. Um, but yeah, God sort of forced his, forced our hand, forced his hand. So he was retrenched from his job all of a sudden looking for some part-time work because we thought, well, maybe if Michael gets a part-time job, then he can apply to study teaching and, you know, maybe God's, God's in that process in, in what's happening. And so we were praying about it and nothing was happening. Nothing was coming through. There was no uh, evidence of a job happening. And so we just talked about it and we said, well, maybe if we just put in your application for table um, college, then, uh, you know, something will come from that because we really sense that maybe God's leading you to, to step into this new opportunity and he's forced our hand and he's pushed you, almost like pushed you out of the nest <laughs> to say, you know what, this is something where you've got to trust me. And so we put in his application and literally a minute later, he got a phone call offering him a job. Like literally, it wasn't, I'm not joking. And so he started doing a full-time job and then it went down to part-time as he started studying. And then uh, because Angus was kidney, we're thinking, oh, how's this going to work with, you know, I was working part-time at the church. And then Pastor Bill called me and said, you know what, I think we'd love to offer you to come on full-time next year. And that was the same time as Angus started school. And so can you see in that process how God went before us? My goodness. My goodness. And so when it time came four years later this year, well, last year Michael finished study and this year was looking for a job and we just, I just was so excited. I wasn't even worried. I was just so excited because I thought, God, you have so clearly led us for him to undertake this study. And yes, there's been sacrifice and yes, there's been, you know, um, times where it's been tricky to know how we're going to pay this or whatever. But Lord, we've seen your faithfulness and your provision as we've put you first. And I was so excited for him just thinking, wherever it is, I know God's got the right role for you. And he was offered, even the circumstances around how he was offered a job. Come and talk to me later. It was, it's amazing. But he's just started work. Uh, the last week he's done his first week at Portside Christian College. Praise God, hey? And so that's awesome. <laughs> But to see the way God goes before, you know, at 16, I went to a camp where Pastor Bill was the, the guest speaker. It was a state camp. I wasn't a Christian at that time. I was 16. And I still remember he spoke on Abraham. And he spoke and he gave a very clear call at the end for anyone who doesn't know Jesus to give their life to him. And I was so close. I was like, yeah, this makes sense. But I didn't make the decision. I didn't open up my life to him. And, and at 16, I said, Mm, not think I'm ready for that. And then three years later, three years later, after probably a lot of pain, God led me to this church, to the Easter Passion Play. And who was preaching again? Pastor Bill. <laughs> and he's sharing God's Word. And, and all of a sudden I thought, yes, Jesus is real. And I've shared about that whole journey of how God you know, led me. And I started by praying, God, if you're real, show me. And led me into this church. I heard the gospel. I heard the good news of Jesus. And I gave my life to him. And I didn't fill in a care card or anything like that. <laughs> and three weeks later, I came back. And the, first, the person who greeted me in the car park was Steph. 
uh, Kipper Toglu, who's actually Bill and Kathy's daughter, who went to the same school as me, but I didn't really know. But she was the one who said, hey, it's really good to see you. Welcome to church. And I felt like, oh, that's someone I sort of know. That's cool. And I come into this place and one of the songs that's playing uh, during the worship time when I come into this place is um, uh, Blessing and Honour. Death Could Not Hold Him Down is the chorus. And that song was sung at my mum's funeral. So I walk into this church. I've been greeted by someone I sort of know and I think, okay, I sort of feel okay here. I walk in. One of the songs in the worship time is this song that was sung at my mum's funeral, a song of declaration, a song of hope. And I just think, wow, God wants me to be here. God goes before, right? And I bet you so many of you have got stories of how God has gone before you in this room. Just think of some of them. They're miraculous. They're amazing. (laughs) Because God is the great initiator. And throughout Scripture, we see this. God repeatedly takes the initiative to make a way where in our own limited human understanding, we cannot see a way. He is the way maker. And... uh, He always and continually makes the first move to deliver and provide for His people. Always and continually. Even when they stubbornly refuse to follow His lead and get themselves into a huge mess. Even when they don't deserve His constant kindness and mercy. Do you know, God's power was miraculously on display as He rescued His people from slavery to the Egyptians in Egypt was miraculously on display. He led them out of Egypt. He parted the Red Sea so they could enter the land he had promised their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. 11 days of travel in the wilderness becomes 40 years of unbelief. What should have taken them 11 days took them 40 years. And only their children can enter the promised land. Tired and frustrated, even Moses, the servant leader God raised up and who knew the Lord face to face in intimate friendship. He rebels against the command of God and he's forbidden from entering the promised land. But the book of Deuteronomy ends with this beautiful picture that Moses climbs this mountain and God allows him to see with his own eyes the promised land. And that's where he dies, on this mountain. He can't go there himself physically, but God allows him to see it for himself. It's just such a beautiful picture. And after mourning Moses, actually before I want to say that, I want to say something else. In Deuteronomy chapter 34, right there where he died in Moab at 120 years old, it says, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. I feel that's a word for some of you this morning. There's spiritual vitality that God wants to continue in you right up to you go see him face to face. Spiritual vitality. You're not done yet. And there may be some things physically like you couldn't do that, like you could once do. But you're not done yet. And you can always, always pray. Praise God. And we need your prayers. We need your prayers. You can pray the Word of God and stand upon His promises to us as a church family. You can pray and believe with us that our greatest days are not behind us, but they're ahead of us. You can pray for hundreds of people to receive Christ this year and be enfolded into our church family. Why not? You can pray for an unprecedented manifestation of God's presence and power as we continue to lift up Christ that many signs and wonders will be done by Jesus at work among us to confirm His Word and to meet genuine needs. Meet genuine needs. You can pray for preachers as they minister God's Word. You can pray for Bill and Kathy in our church board of elders. You can pray for our seat and senior leadership team and our congregation pastors. You can pray that many more people would discover their spiritual gifts and be deployed in strategic roles within this body of believers so that we might be continued to be built up You can pray that the Lord of the harvest would continue to send us out as harvest workers. Am I hearing an amen from some people? Because this is what we're believing for. You can pray that there would be a mighty army of children and young people reached and raised up as followers of Jesus. You can pray for new churches to be birthed and new missionaries to be sent out. Why not? After Moses' death and the time of mourning, God speaks to Joshua, Moses' aid, and he said, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land he's about to give them, into the land I'm about to give you. 
And the first thing I want, I feel that the Lord wants us to remember this morning or know or hear for the first time is that God always goes first. God always goes first. He does. He's the great initiator. <laughs> the people may have been wondering what next? What are we going to do with, about, without Moses? Moses, the great man, what are we going to do? But God speaks to Joshua and tells him to speak to the people and affirm that his purpose and promise remains the same. His purpose and his promise remains the same. In Joshua 3, let's have a look at that. Verse 9 to 11, it says, Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites and the Jebusites. C, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. This is how you will know. And the ark in the Old Testament was the resting place for God's presence. A resting place of God's presence. And so it's, he's saying God himself will go before you. God himself will go before you. God always goes first. Moses had also reassured them before his death, God always goes first. He said to them in Deuteronomy 9 verses 1 to 3, he said, Hear Israel, you are about to cross the Jordan to go in and dispossess nations greater and stronger than you, with large cities that have walls up to the sky. The people are strong and tall, Anakites. You know about them and have heard it said, who can stand up against the Anakites? But be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes ahead of you like a devouring fire. And I believe the Holy Spirit is applying this word to us today to assure our hearts be assured in our own families, in our workplaces, in our schools, in the ministry teams we have the privilege of being part of, in the doctor's report we might have received, in our marriages and our friendships, in the dreams God's put in our hearts that He's wanting to come to pass. Be assured today, Christian Family Centre, the Lord, your God, is the one who goes ahead of you. Can you say amen to that? God always goes first. He made the first move in his rescue plan. In fact, he didn't just make the first move. He signed, sealed and delivered it with the blood of his son, Jesus. He made the first move. He entered the mess of sinful humanity. He decided to come, not to point the finger, but to set things right. He gave of himself. God sent his son to come into this world to die on the most horrible death on a cross, for your sin and my sin, for the barrier that's between us and God. Without Jesus, we would not be able to know God as our Heavenly Father. But praise God, He made the first move <laughs> and He accomplished it and He did it and He said it on that cross. It is finished. It is finished. Because He did everything necessary. Everything necessary. You can't earn your way to God. You can't please your way to God. You can't worship your way to God. You can't make yourself good enough and pull yourself up by the bootstraps for God. None of us can. But He sent Jesus because He so loves you. He so loves you that He doesn't want you to experience this life or heaven. Well, you can't experience heaven without Him. But he doesn't want heaven to be without you. He wants you to have a personal relationship with him. And so he came personally, entered this mess and this yuck, dealt with the problem of sin, completely became sin so that we could experience and become God's righteousness. So we could experience and become and receive the free gift of forgiveness, the free gift of a brand new start with God, the free gift of Jesus' perfect record applied to us. And he died and he was buried. But after three days, death could not hold him down. Hallelujah. He rose from the dead and he's alive. He's risen from the dead. 
And anyone and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord can come into a personal relationship with Him. And so if you've never done that before, if you've never called upon Him and said, Jesus, I want to put my trust in You. I want to give my life to You. I want You to come and lead my life and help me because I've made a mess of it, but I want You to help me. He will. He'll come in. So awesome. God always goes first. He didn't spare His Son but he gave him up for you and for me, for all of humanity. Romans 8.32 says, How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? There's some things that you need, things that you are facing. If Jesus has already paid the price for you on the cross, how will he not also graciously give you the things that you need? Sometimes not the things that you want, sure, but the things that you need. You can trust your life to Him. You can. You can stake your life on Him. You can hold fast to Him. You can expect His ultimate good and His perfect will and His plan for your life as you admit your need for Him. You can. The gospel is so good news because He went first. He went first. (laughs) He took the initiative and He did everything necessary to open up a new and living way so that we might know God. How awesome is that? In Romans 8 verse 3 in the message it says, God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. And he offers us salvation. He offers us free gift of eternal life. He offers us forgiveness. But then he says, it's your move. It's your move. Do you want me? Do you want my help? Will you receive my forgiveness? Will you let me love you and lead you your life, your life? And he still says to us as we follow him, will you allow me to have my way in and through you? Will you you invite me to come and live in you? Verse 4 in the message goes on to say, the law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asks for but we couldn't deliver is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Doesn't that take a load off? <laughs> it's not trying more. Jesus Christ has come to live on us on the inside. It's not striving. It's saying, God, you live in me. You love me. You're for me. You're with me. I'm going to embrace what you're doing in my life. I'm not going to resist it. I'm going to cooperate. I'm going to embrace what you're doing. What is the Spirit of God wanting to do in us? That's a good question. Do you know there's a sermon title that Spurgeon, the great Charles Spurgeon, preached about Joshua, and it was called Untrodden Ways. I believe that the Holy Spirit is saying to us today that for the Christian Family Centre, there are some untrodden ways ahead of us. We haven't been there yet. We haven't experienced that yet, but God's got these amazing things for us ahead. This church was birthed by God and is 44 years old. But do you know what? In God's eyes, it's only 44 years young. Do you really believe that? I do with all my heart. (laughs) Have a look at this amazing statement that Pastor Bill put together. It's called, I Have a Dream. And he wrote it uh, for a a national conference, put it together and it's part of some of our documentation, our moving forward document and things like that. But I want to read it today because it's so powerful. It paints a picture of what God is wanting to do, what the Spirit of God is wanting to do in us. And continuing to want to do in us. Have a listen to it. 
I have a dream for the Christian Family Centre that we will be a Bible-based, Christ-centred and contemporary Australian church, graced field communities where people of all races and ages fully devote themselves to following Jesus Christ. It's a dream we all share. Do you share this dream? I feel like today God's saying, this can be your dream. It doesn't just have to be Pastor Bill's or some other people's. It can be your dream as well. A dream of being a truly authentic New Testament church, a people who fervently love Jesus, who genuinely love each other and who passionately love the unreached of our world. A people who influence our world for good by living Christ-like lives wherever we are and whatever we do. And he goes on to paint and says, imagine what this could look like. And before he, I want to read that bit, I want to say, God can do super abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. Have a listen to this verse. It says, Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, hopes or dreams, according to what? His power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that includes our church and our generations and the generations that are to come. Yes? You're allowed to interact and get excited. All right? You're allowed to say, yes, God, I agree. Yes, let it be so. Amen. You're allowed to say that. (laughs) All right. Knowing that, that God can carry out his purpose and do super abundantly all that we can ask or imagine. This is what Pastor Bill has, through the Spirit of God, imagined. And I think Let's grab it with both hands. It's awesome. Imagine our church with thousands of on-fire disciples who energetically embrace Jesus' great commandment, worshipping God with full abandon and selflessly ministering to humanity's deepest needs. Imagine this united army (laughs) wholeheartedly committed to obeying the Great Commission, constantly reaching out to spiritually lost people with the miracle-working gospel of Jesus Christ. Local bodies of believers. It's not just this church. This church has birthed other churches. Local bodies of believers who know deep down that the church has been entrusted with Christ's life-changing message. And Jesus' church really is the hope of all the world. I see many hundreds of men and women, young and old, being taught, trained and mentored to fulfil Jesus' leadership call in their lives. What an awesome vision. Do you see that? Can you see it? By faith. Hundreds of leaders being powerfully equipped and led by the Holy Spirit to go throughout Australia and the nation's changing worlds. I see CFC ministers, missionaries and church planters birthing new churches, establishing new people helping ministries and developing new humanitarian ventures. Yes, that's the right word. (laughs) I love this bit. Ordinary people, that's me. Is that you? Are you ordinary pe- people? We, we know we're ordinary. We're extraordinary because God made us, but we're ordinary because we're sinful and we're frail and we're weak. But ordinary people empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish extraordinary things in Christ's name. I see hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of people in heaven welcoming us into the very presence of the Father. Can you hear them cheering wildly at our homecoming? All because we allowed Jesus to soften our hearts and expand our vision. Today, church, He's wanting to soften our hearts. 10.30 congregation. He's wanting to expand our vision to match His very own. This is not just my dream. This is God's heart for the Christian Family Centre. And it really is possible. It it really is possible. If God goes before, if God raised Jesus from the dead, if God is all powerful, it, it really is possible. It really is. Not in our strength, but in His strength. Do you share this dream? Do you see yourself as a vital part of it? I do, (laughs) and I see each one of you as our 1030 congregation, a vital and necessary part of it. God has uniquely gifted and graced you to play a vital role. 
None of us are superfluous. You know what superfluous, I can't even say it. Superfluous is, it's unnecessary. None of us are superfluous, unnecessary (laughs) to God's dream for this church. None of us. I'm telling you, none of you. You're not just plugging a seat. You're not just filling a gap. You have been brought here by the sovereign will of God to be part of this local body of believers. I truly believe it with all my heart. So why don't you ask Jesus, what's my part, Lord? What's my part? We can't all be an eye. We can't all be an ear. A body has many parts. What's my part, Lord? How do you want to use me to help your dream for this church become a reality? Do you know our Creative Ministries production team? We need a whole stack of people to help with that. Our Creative Ministries team serve their guts out. Bless them. (laughs) Many of you serve your guts out, I know. But if you're not serving and you want to have a go at something, go and see Alyssa. Alyssa, can you wave? Stand up and turn around. Thank you. Or she won't stand up. Okay. Go and see Alyssa because Alyssa and Nathan will give you a job. Go and see Kathy Vasilakis because our kitchen team, she's ready. <laughs> our kitchen team, you know, there's been people who've been serving on our kitchen team for so many years and praise God. You know, that is unique that at our 1030 service, after every service, we have a meal. That is unique. That is amazing so that we can stay and have fellowship and enjoy beautiful food at a low cost and just sit over a table with one another and Impart life to each other in Jesus' name. That's beautiful. But we have a need for a whole stack more kitchen team ministry members. So if you're not serving, that's a great way just to jump in and have a go. You know, Kathy, we don't want her to be on four teams every week. You know, we can each play a part. You, can, you might think, well, that's not my gift. Well, how about you just roll up your sleeves and have a go and serve? And as you do that, God might then open other doors and opportunities for you. Man, there's so many other opportunities in our kids' ministry. Look, I could just talk for hours. But if you need to know what is my part, maybe an action point for you today is you need to go have a conversation. Don't wait for someone to tap you on the shoulder. Go and have a conversation. Go and talk to one of our ministry leaders. Go and talk to one of our pastors because you might think, I fit here, but we might think, you know what? I reckon start here. And as we talk about it, as we pray about it with you, we want to encourage you and help you find a place where you can serve and use the gifts that God's given you. Go on, that's your action point maybe from today. Have a conversation. Start a conversation somewhere. Do you know the story of God prompting the man who used to own this land? Old man Simmons, some of you know it. There was a man... 100 plus years ago who owned this land that our church is built on and he would get up and he would pray over this land continually. God, raise up a great church. 100 years before this church was birthed, that's what he would pray. Wow. We've heard that because we know the family members who verified that that's what he used to do. That's amazing, amazing encouragement that God's birthed our church family. But do you know what? We've already seen that God's heart and his vision for CFC was so much bigger than raise up a great church here because now there's churches in the Northern Territory, (laughs) in Tasmania, CFC South has been planted, the Barossa, the Hills. You think about what God's done. Yes, he prayed that God would raise up a great church, but that that church... We're always continually on the journey to becoming great in Jesus' name, (laughs) but has planted a whole stack of other churches. I mean, God has done exceedingly abundantly more than old man Simmons prayed. What could God do in the next 44 years ahead of us? Amazing to think about. And so God always goes first. But the other thing I want to say this morning, I feel that the Lord's put on my heart to share is that following, following Jesus, following the God who always goes first, always requires faith and obedience. In Joshua 3, it says, Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. They're standing on the banks. God says, cross the Jordan. And we think the Jordan, you know, 
at, at flood stage is not this nice calm thing. Well, let's have a look at some of the pictures. Thanks, Isaac. Keep going. More like that. Keep going. No, that's the bit we think it's like. Go back one. We think Jordan. Yeah, they could have swum across. No worries. Keep going. More like that. <laughs> because the Jordan River drops from Mount, the start, Mount Hermon to the Dead Sea and it, go, it drops, drops, drops. So the Mount Hermon is, you know, 400 and something metres uh, above. Let me find my notes so I don't get it wrong. No, 2,000 metres above sea level. The Dead Sea is nearly 400 and something metres below sea level. So there's 27 rapids on the Jordan River to get to the Dead Sea. It's not this little easy ride to cross it. <laughs> They're standing on the banks of the Jordan River that's flooded and God says, cross the river. But he also says, I will go before you and you will cross over on dry ground. Wow. Following where God was leading them required faith and obedience because we know that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. God had said to them repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly, I will go first. I will go before you. I am leading the way. I am the God who goes before you like a devouring fire. He'd said all these promises to them, but it now required them to step out in faith and obedience. In Hebrews 6, in the message, it says, it is impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that He exists and that He cares enough to respond to those who seek Him. The Jordan is at flood stage during all harvest, but the, le, the next part of that verse says, yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water upstream stopped flowing. The priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had complete, completed the crossing on dry ground. The priests had to show faith and obedience by walking forward with the ark. <laughs> the people had to show faith and obedience by crossing over when they were like, what if the water comes down and what if my child can't get across and all the what ifs. But with the crossing of the Jordan, there was a brand new generation who experienced the miracle working power of God. But they had to exercise faith that God is who he says he is and would do what he said he would do. And then they actually had to walk across the river on dry ground. In Joshua 4, 23, 24, it says, For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. Before us, before you. Beautiful. Two different miracles. God showing that he's the same God who parted the Red Sea can part the Jordan. The same God who birthed this church is leading it into its future. He did this so all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. I came here this morning. I've been sick as this week, but I felt like God said, nah, you need to preach this message. So I've been praying, 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 going, pray for me. I came here this morning to tell you the hand of our Lord is still powerful. It's still powerful. Maybe you've heard some of the stories of how God has moved miraculously to save people and bring people into our church and like cars stopping out the front of people's places, running out of petrol, coming in and falling down and giving their lives to Christ. Maybe you've heard stories about that. You've heard stories of how God has provided buildings in this land and some of the people who exercise faith and obedience are now in heaven and we honour them and they're the cloud of witnesses cheering us on and some of those people who've sowed in faith and obedience are here in this room and we honour you and we love you and we thank you for all that you've sown at cost 
into the Christian Family Centre because you love Jesus. But you know, each of us, each of the generations represented in this church and alive right now, we get to exercise faith in what God wants to do and through the CFC right now and into the future. Your faith is precious. Your faith is powerful. Without faith, you can't receive and lay hold of all the things that Jesus has already won for you. Without faith, without releasing your faith in a faithful God. At the end of Pastor Bill's, I have a dream statement. He says, as we prayerfully unite and purposefully work together, uplifting Christ's name and doing Christ's will here on earth, Jesus promises us, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And so my prayer, along with Pastor Bill, I hope it's your prayer this morning is, oh Lord, build your church and let this dream become a reality. I want to finish with this truth. God always goes before us. Following always requires faith and obedience. I really felt this very strongly. God wants us to know this morning. The living God is among us. The living God is among us. Do you believe that? Joshua 3.10 says, This is how you will know that the living God is among you. In Acts 2, Peter stood up full of the Holy Spirit and he said, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and He's poured out what you now see and hear when the Holy Spirit come upon all the believers and they began to speak in this beautiful prayer language as God gave them ability. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Both Lord and Messiah. He is Lord of the Christian Family Centre. He is Lord. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. He's the promised one. Jesus is our way maker for He is both Lord and Messiah, the crucified one now resurrected, reigning at the right hand of the Father. And in Joshua 3, He told the people, consecrate yourselves. To consecrate yourselves means to set yourself apart for something important. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. I believe that through this series, He's asking us, to dedicate ourselves afresh to be used by Him because He wants to do amazing things in and through us this year. I believe it with all of my heart through what on earth am I here for campaign and beyond. Right here today, as we release our faith and are obedient to His Word, He wants to manifest His presence and power and do amazing things to confirm His Word. Can you say amen to that? In Acts 2, Acts 4, sorry. I should say four. The people who were under threat after Peter had been released from prison, they got together and they prayed and they said, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy, all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the Word of God boldly. God is stirring our faith today. He's stirring it. And He's saying, trust me, believe me. Look, I can do what I say I can do. I am who I say I am. Why don't we stand to our feet?